You're just going to have head banging in the U.S. to try to do this. No other way. Dismantling the American Hospital Association, the amount of lobbying they have in the government is higher than the NRA. So if you think you can do this in the U.S., haha, I'm sorry, it won't happen. Not in not in the next decade, because Uh we're not going to have universal health care. When are we going to get that? We are going to talk about the future of the hospital room. You know, how does the hospital room translate? How do we take where we are today to the actual future state of where we should be going? Which one of you gentlemen would like to start? I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, I think this is the long-term big picture that we gut hospitals and leave them with their, you know, operating rooms and intensive care units, you know, emergency room some fancy imaging labs, but basically the rest of the hospital is moved to the patient's home. That can be achieved now because we can do exquisite monitoring and with the right type of interpretation in real time before a person has any compromise, we could alert the staff as to intervening. So we are moving in that direction. We saw it start in certain health systems that you basically were using this type of monitoring to avoid hospitalization. It will take time because in this country, we have lots of incumbents that like the hospital, not the patients, but the, the hospitals and the lobbying force of the American Hospital Association. But the sensor, the AI, the analytic capabilities now are moving really quickly. And you can envision when the hospital of the future will be a very different looking entity as it is uh, from now. Let's say that we want the hospital room to be our bedroom. You know, how do we how do we take it from where it is today and use technology to make that happen? Yeah, well, I was working actually on a on a company for the hospital room at home, but it was extremely difficult because telehealth, everyone looked at it like, you know, it's a, it's an inferior part of health and it's not really well distributed and we don't have the right video conferencing tools. Now, I think is the right time. And also, why is it the right time? First of all, we have telehealth everywhere. Secondly, because people want to be, they are prepared for anything now. Ah, let's prepare for nuclear, let's prepare for, you know, but why shouldn't we prepare for, why shouldn't we have a hospital room at home? And then the idea came to me that you would need just a normal room, but just like in the movie Transformers, that that normal room can become a hospital room. And so we were working on the bed and put a lot of sensors in that bed. And then you have a TV and you basically put a camera on the TV or use the camera in the TV. And and that gets you already uh, far because audio and visual geometries are basically superhuman because they give us uh, sonograms and and spectrograms. These are granularities that uh, no human being can see, you know, like because they're, they're, but you can follow actually somebody lying in in a bed with the deltas, how his face looks, or how his, how his voice sounds. So the next thing we did was we asked doctors when they come, to, when people come to the emergency room, what are they most here that they shouldn't be here? You know, like IVs. You know, like saline. You know, like you know, you know, we can do that at home. Mm-hmm. You know, like in the in the army. Uh, we in my country we had to go to the army and we got like a two day combat medicine. Two days we learned that we gave uh, e- each other intramuscular injections, <laughs> um, and uh, but we also learned Max M A C S. That's all you need on the battlefield. The M stands for morphine, the A for antibiotics, the C for cortisol, and the S for superglue. You know. Uh, that's that's all, you know, no medical records, so no. Yeah. And basically, I think that people are going to start with what's happening now. And, and, and of course, Eric has been talking about that for a long time already. The medicalized smartphone is getting more and more real every day. You know, every new smartwatch, you know, like which now connects to everything else of that Apple network is setting more and more of these diagnostics in. And, and of course, Eric is also right that 
hospitals will not want this for, you know, like nobody likes to disappear. Or if you go to somebody and say, I'm, I'm going to unbundle you, what do you think about it? <laughs> you know, they're already, you know, struggling. There are too many hospitals. And, and so but, uh, now there was always the argument about the patient data. If you have data and you go to a hospital and you say, hey, that's my data, you know, the hospitals used to say, no, no. All right, the data comes out your body, but without our machines and our algorithms, we cannot extract that data and we cannot interpret that data. But now they have that with that medicalized smartphone. And I believe that Eric predicted it 10 years ago, you know, like this is going to be the beginning of the medical buyer's market. You know, the patient will be a buyer's market and this will change a lot of things because it starts now already because there are no participants anymore in clinical trials. So there are heavy recruitment going on. So people will soon realize, and that's uh, one of our slogans that we are all medical researchers. We just don't know. We can all contribute to research by giving our data and by uh, you know, participating in clinical trials. We should participate all more in clinical trials, but in a buyer's market, we will be paid more for that. So when people are paid more, they quickly find out how the system works and they want to know more. So I believe the next step will be what I call consumer med school. They will need to learn like, okay, what do we do if people have a seizure? What do we do if I have to give an injection, you know, or what is an EpiPen? And so more and more, they will learn about that care universe which a nurse now does. And the next thing they will do is they will want their hospital room at home. And probably five, five, five years away to 10 years away, they will set up their own peer-to-peer -peer pharmacology. You know, like if you are with, two, uh, with uh, 30 million diabetics, why don't you make your own drugs? You know, like uh, you, uh, there are expired patents and FDA cleared. So let's just make our own drugs in vertical disease groups. These are all things coming for, I think, for patient emancipation so and the buyer. So, Eric, now, would you let Walter inject you with anything? Probably not, well, right? <laughs> Walter inject me? Yeah. No, with, well, well with, it, with intellectual fodder, but, well, you know. He, you know, he was saying he was he, he, in the army great. injecting people. It's like, what? You know. <laughs> no, he, he's a man of ideas, a great man yeah. of ideas. But I don't know I want to take any medicine from him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Eric, so. We, we have too many hospitals, as, as you and, and uh, Walter are alluding to. Does this mean that we have to redefine the role of the hospital? Because for acute care, you're not going to do that at home, right? So does, does it mean that even though we're in a transitionary time, where we're going to is the role of the hospital changes and the, the sort of, you know, the role of the home uh, patient changes? Well, you know, first, I don't know that I would say that we've got too many hospitals. In fact, if you, if you compare it to Europe, for example, you know, we actually have much less per capita. The issue we have is maldistribution. Thousands of hospitals have closed in recent years, in the last decade, and a lot of times communities were just shut out and they protested and it didn't go very far because they were losing from a revenue base. And so they couldn't be sustained. And a lot of times they were in vulnerable communities. The issue is what's so attractive about the hospital in the bedroom or in the patient's home is that you get rid of that problem because you can monitor it on the internet. You don't have to be proximal. And you know whether it's an ambulance or home health nurse or whatever, you could dispatch from wherever these operations are having monitoring. And I think that's the future. That's what's so exciting is that we have this connectivity. Now, what's also very interesting, and this brings up a point that, you know, Walter touched on, if we really were smart, instead of our sheer stupidity, the, the homeless people and the indigent, we would give them a smartphone and a data plan, because for years of that, it would be cheaper than one emergency room visit or one night in a hospital. A hospital uh, charge is $5,000 per day, average in the United States. I mean, that's enormous. You could, you could give like a lifetime plan of a, of a smartphone and years of data plan, a broadband. So 
these are the kinds of economic issues. And the biggest one really is that we can do this now. We can validate, do randomized trials, you know, ice this. But we have a counter force, which is what is the number one line item in healthcare in the United States of 3.7 trillion? What is it? Hospitals. Hospitals. It's almost 1.3 or 1.25 trillion dollars. Do you think the hospitals want to give that up? So we're talking about reimbursement, right? Yeah. So it's so all, it's a- basically all the people and and all the equipment and you know the all the resources that have been built up that are set for a different model. Now, when I did the NHS review, the enthusiasm for this was at the extreme level. And why was it so different? Because they don't get any reimbursement, right? They just want to use resources in their most efficient way. So I saw like night and day, the UK, New Zealand, and any country that has healthcare where it's universal and there is no specific hospital reward financially, they like this. And they're going after it. And we will be left in the wake of all that. We, we will be the last country unless we have radical change to adopt this model. I have um, a question, Eric, about just the, sorry, Jesse, but the, this is the specific also, is there, is there any kind of anecdotal or maybe real research around also a person being treated at home, maybe having better outcomes? You know, when I go to the doctor, I get what is it called white coat syndrome. My blood yeah. pressure goes up. And it's real and it, you know, and that really happens. And that's just for general. Do, do we also think that, or have we done studies to see that also this makes a healthier population? That's one question, Eric. The other one I'm gonna throw in is, we gotta go one step further with giving the homeless the smartphones because they don't have a hospital, they don't have a bed. How do we yeah. get a bed? Yeah, we get, we gotta do that too. All right. Uh, in a home yeah, but but I, I totally agree on that point. We have to do trials to prove this thesis of people being fine at home. Your question, Priscilla, is that could they do better? I think all we want to do is show they do as well. If we show better, that would be wonderful. Uh, having been a patient in the hospital, like you know many uh, you have, I think you can say a lot of bad things happen in the hospital. You know, and if you're at home, you're protected. And that's obviously different than just going for a clinic visit when you have only a matter of minutes. This is, you know, getting tests that you might not need, missing the medications you normally take. I mean, all sorts of things can happen in the hospital setting, the worst of which is getting an infection that's these, you know, resistant strains that live in the hospital, the nosocomial world. So I would be happy to show in a large randomized trial of subcritically ill, not ICU patients, that they had at least as good outcome. If they have better, well, that's like a bonus. But the point is, is that at least as good is, is all we need to show. That's a good idea, Eric. If we saw a sort of comparative study, you know, that, that we, because, and I'm thinking of the hospital room at home, not a place where, you know, it's not an ICU. It's a place where you can heal or long-term re- rehab. And I think it also makes sense for uh, payers. It's true, $5,000 a night. So... I looked at what makes people not like hospitals. There are things like light and sound and interruptions. People say, did you sleep well? Well, how can you sleep well when five times during the night somebody comes in, puts on the light, starts to do stuff. Also, you hear everyone. You hear them, you know, like uh, uh, you hear them talking in, in the corridor and they have lives and you are sick you know like it's a very binary situation hospital rooms at home should be soundproof should be like a very special light that makes you feel relaxed also the smell should be different you know we can work on all these sensorium that makes people heal better but also and i I don't want to be macabre here but we built places where we can live we call it houses and we can we build places where people die in hospitals most people i think me included i would prefer to die at home well we prefer you not to die yeah Yeah. live forever walter (laughs) yeah i'm trying and and i'll i will try need you walter no guarantee (laughs) (laughs) so so you guys how So we know the idealized state. We can see a place where the role of the hospital might change and the role of the home might change. We talked about $5,000 as a a number for a hospital room. Can we get a home room that is $5,000 that's going to be able to let you do almost the same amount of things? 
you could just get some cheap sensors and you could even pay for the Wi-Fi if a person doesn't have it. You want something that's really frugal innovation, certain health systems, some large ones. They used an arm sensor from Current Health that got all vital signs except for blood pressure, or there's these chest buttons. You know, you, you couldn't just get the smartwatch or fitness band. You need some extra sensors to get vital signs. Something like that, you get, instead of the one-off, the nurse that comes in and does discovery rounds that, you know, code blue or that your person's already cold and dead, now you have continuous monitoring. The regular patient room is not one that has continuous monitoring in hospitals. Some have telemetry where they look at your heart rhythm, but that's it. They don't look at your blood pressure and your respiratory rate and all these other parameters. So what we're talking about is having ICU monitoring in the patient's regular bed. And also they have mobility. So they don't have to be you know, chained down. They can walk around the house. This won't fly if there's a big expenditure. And these sensors are cheap. It's mainly analytics of the data. That's really, you know, what this, what's driving this. Do you, you, know, do you also need a nurse? I mean, do you need somebody there as well? Like, No, so that's the whole idea. You basically, no, yeah. it, that data is under continuous surveillance. And then a nurse slash doctor, the monitor hawks. There is humans in the loop. And, and, you know, we have places like Mercy Hospital in St. Louis where they're monitoring, you know, 100 people and it's just one or two people that are looking after 100 people. That's kind of where we're headed here. And we yeah. will, you know, just gut the number yeah. of pe people that, you know, the nurses and doctors and support staff that are needed just right. because you're doing this at scale, you're using algorithms. And the only thing you have to do is prove that it works really well. It has to be definitive clinical trial. Right. Well, but what happens if like not something needs to be administered immediately? So how do you account for, okay, suddenly the system is going, there's, there's a, something's going on, you're having a heart yeah, attack. Yeah, well, that, right. But that, your point here is that you have to have algorithms that sense deterioration so you have time, Yeah. Right? right? You know, depending on the person's condition, you have to make provisions. Like, for example, we have home defibrillators and a person of that caliber uncertainty, they have to have someone with them doesn't have to be a, you know, the home defibrillators. I don't know if you ever seen them in action. A five-year-old could do it. The three-year-old probably couldn't lift it, but the five-year-old can do it. It says, do this one, two, three, and you're done. So that's the worst thing is that you'd have to defibrillate a patient. Otherwise, most of the things you're going to, you're just monitoring. And then if there's a problem, you send out a, a paramedic. Uh, Eric, you brought up a very interesting point there because now we are all about big data. What Eric hints at is a continuous wave of data. Right. So instead of big data, long continua. And if you have waves, there you can easily see, even the algorithms can see it, where the de deterioration happens or when it's on a level that you think this has to be monitored. In hospitals, you have that in ICU. I remember when my son was in ICU, when we had to leave ICU, I didn't want to leave. I said, no, no, it's better here. <laughs> you know, it's like going back to the Middle Ages there, you know, like right. because there you are, you know, 24 seven monitor. So that hospital at home, this could be continuously monitored. Yes, it's essential. Yeah. And, and that gets to Priscilla's point that it actually could wind up being superior. Yeah. Because yeah. The, in hospital, the $5,000, where does that get you? Each shift, every eight hours, somebody comes in and checks your vital signs. And yeah. in every hospital in the United States, at least one shift per shift, someone walks in and that person's dead. Dead. Cold and dead. Yeah. All right? So, you know, that, that's why you can beat that with a, with a continuous monitoring. And if you then think of hospitals of the future... Because hospitals are very good, actually, at doing big supply chains. Now, if that hospital would set up monitoring and call centers for hospital rooms at home, everyone would take a subscription. They would just make the same money with less work, which is sort of, you know, the mission of our existence. <laughs> so let's say, okay, we want to do this. Where do we start? Because you're going to have to pick a condition. And then you mentioned two or three different sensors. How do we decide which sensors? How do we decide about the criteria of this first study of this idea? Well, there's a lot of ways to do this, but the one I favor the most is, you know, all subacute conditions that are not in the ICU because you're trying to simulate the regular hospital room. So it's the hospital room. And 
you know, it, so it that wouldn't means, matter what condition they had. No, and the, if there's some instability that's notable, or that you might have a group that you would exclude, mm -hmm. but you want to make it as little as exclusion as possible to simulate what would be, you know, the the real choice of you know, the path that we're talking about. So you'd have a diverse group, you know, they could be people that had infections, they could be, you know, people with pneumonia, you know, a long list, they're just not sick enough that they're, they're not about to go in the ICU or need an ICU, they could be people that in the emergency room, you just send them home, or you admit them to the hospital, you know, they can come in in many different ways. But the point is, is that half of them are randomized once you have the, the package, you know, with a warm up, you validate that these algorithms are working and you only are worried about vital signs. Your, your point about what sensors, vital signs, period. You have continuous vital signs. That's it. And that would include oxygen saturation, which you don't normally have in a regular hospital room. You just have a, somebody comes in and says, uh, you know, how many breaths per minute What's their heart rate? Here, you're going to have heart rhythm. You're going to have oxygen saturation. You get a lot more granular data and you have it continuous. So basically, you're going to have more data and you have to have a plan for each patient. If something shows a sign of deterioration, is there a person, is there someone live with that person? How long does it take for paramedics to get there? Who's doing the monitoring? So you have to have that path of surveillance. So would it be two groups of people, one group of people who's in the hospital and one yeah. group, of, group of people who is not in the hospital? Right. Once you have this analytics built mm -hmm. and tested, validated, then you just randomize. You're staying in, you're going home, and you know you get you have to have thousands of people in each arm. How how many how many people, Eric? How well, you'd people? have to calculate the endpoint, which would be some kind of composite death or other irrevocable hits, you know, do they have significant organ damage as a result, whether their heart, their brain, their kidney, you know, that kind of thing. Is there a geographic restriction or condition around? No. You? So you want to go? Broad as you can. Planetary. Well, I mean. The planet what, Earth. Yeah. <laughs> well, Eric, you know, when do you hope that this future comes into play and how do we push it forward so that this happens as soon as possible? We'll move outside the U.S. That's how you push it forward. Well, you know, actually, I had a question. About Although the doctors could be here monitoring. Well, this is yeah, they call. could be. You're well, right. There you go. Yeah. A new, a new way of living. The, yeah. the, a new choice instead of their current jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I think Walter just said the yeah the 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 people were monitoring monitoring from home type thing right it's working from home the yeah, in pajamas yeah yeah just the, like, the yeah, doctors yeah. could be at home too that's what sure but, but my question okay so here's where we got to be clever or you're all the brilliant people because what's the incentive you know you just say the hospitals make all this money what is the opportunity right to the hospital besides the fact that the U S is once will be left behind. If you all go off and do this and Eric leaves and goes somewhere and does it with Walter, but what is the incentive? How do we repurpose? Like where's the financial incentive? Cause that's always about the money here. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, that's why I said, you're just going to have head banging in the U S to try there's to do there's this. No other way. The, the, dismantling the American hospital association, yeah. the amount of lobbying they have in the government is higher than the NRA. So yeah. if you think you can do this in the U S Haha, <laughs> I'm sorry, it won't happen. Not in not in the next decade, because uh -oh. we're not going to have universal health care. When are we going to get that? Yeah. I, um, so the only way we can now have hospital rooms at home is out of pocket, you know. And yeah. people will do it, I think, because they are not prepared for anything. But in Eric's idea of the continuous function, you know, passively collecting at home, what would be a big advantage for medical research is. That, so we have no understanding of a forward model of healing. We only understand disease partially going back by putting people at home. I'm sure you heal better. But of course, we have to prove that. But that I'm sure that this will come out. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for spending some time with us talking about it. As always, a total pleasure. And I uh, look forward to speaking with you guys again. I'm optimistic. You. But we're going to do something about this okay. problem, okay? okay. <laughs> Brilliant ideas. Thank Bye you. Bye, you guys. Fantastic. We got to figure out how, if they can't do it here, they'll, they got to start working on this. Cause I, I'm with, I believe Walter's point of view. I mean, in my, uh, I, you know, I do, I feel like people might do better at home. Just oh, I think they, I think they definitely would do better at home. And I think that maybe it has to start by people just paying for it. There's a lot of people who would just pay for it and and, uh, you know, once it's there, once a lot of people are just paying for it, then 
you know, eventually reimbursement will come in. I hope so, but it doesn't solve the problem, which is if you pay for a good health care, you get good health care. And this is something that yeah. should be failed. I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. there's a there's a justice issue in, involved, but uh, a big one. OK, well, please subscribe. Uh, Priscilla makes fun of me for saying that, but I think it's no, no, important. No, no, please subscribe because we do want to we really want these ideas that you just heard about uh, and today discussed. These are really brilliant. These are brilliant innovators and now she's saying this but you know before she didn't care if anybody subscribed. well it just no i'm just saying this is something we we all need to kind of be pushing forward so i agree please leave a comment bye you guys